Come on now, people. I've been telling you for almost two years now, you need to have a GNR TV. And now sports are back. Football is back. Now is the perfect time for you to get this if you don't have it already. And if you look on over here, as I've been telling you before, you get all these amazing channels, every single one of them, for $20 a month for two devices. And if you look on up over here, it's written. It's written everything you get with GNR TV. If you want four devices, $40. And there's some cool extras right here. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, get it. What more can I say? What more can I say? It's time to cut the damn cord, stop being ripped off by the dish and cable, and get this lovely thing we call GNR TV. Streaming done right. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Well, this station's mask. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Today I have my guest, Joe. Joe, how are you doing? Looks like you're sipping on some fancy wine over there. Hey, Joe Bizarro here. Coming to you from Austin, Texas. And thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on your show. I'd love to, to talk some, let's talk some horror. Oh, hell yeah. First of all, thank you for coming on my show. And I know it's going to be a good time already. <laughs> we had a few technical difficulties, people, but hey, it happens. It's life. It's 2022. So, you know. Bear with us. But um, I did watch your film, Brides of, oh, wow, Brides of Satan last week. Was it last? Yeah, last Tuesday, actually. And it was a fun film. Lots of titties, which you can never complain about lots of titties. Like that, that was something that I noticed quick, which when people do get to see this film, you're going to notice that very, very quick and often. And again, the more the merrier, the way I see it. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a fun film. It was different. I don't want to. I did review it last week. I don't want to spoil it too much on the interview, so people can kind of see it or go back to the review I did. But um, I what one thing I will say I liked about it without spoiling it is how you had it split up like in the chapters one through I want to say one through six I believe. And I like the blonde chick. I like. I'm just thinking like it's Mindy Robinson. Yeah. What I what I liked about her was uh the beginning where they go into that shady spot and it's like every guy's dream of, you know, the way the setup happens. I don't want to, I'm not going to spoil it, but the way that setup happens, the way it could have panned out, you're just like, holy shit. And then boom, everything just chaos from, from then on out was just chaos. Pretty much. But I mean, I can, I can answer any questions you have about the movie because it was a five year experience. There's, there's so much that we went through, there's so many stories. There's so many anecdotes. There's so many things that the movie was supposed to be that it didn't become. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't read your review. In fact, I didn't know you read it, that you had reviewed it, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, but yeah, I think it's a fun movie. We definitely tried to make something that was entertaining. I, I'm a huge believer in pacing. I like good pacing in films. Mm -hmm. When I watch a movie, I like to be entertained from the very beginning all the way to the end, or, you know, or at least it has to catch me and bring me in. And, you know, I feel like, you know, you mentioned that there's a lot of nudity in the film. We did that intentionally because we wanted to, you know, have a better chance with the distributor. And we, we, we'd we heard, you know, the word around the block is that, you know, sex and nudity sells. And we put it right there in the opening scene. So if you turn that thing on and you see girls on a pole, you're probably already... My theory is if you spend five minutes, 10 minutes with the movie, you're probably invested for the whole thing. So uh, anything you want to talk about the film, um, and I'm not too worried about sp spoilers or anything like that. I mean, I don't want to give away the ending or anything like that, but we can talk about the characters and any scenes that you may want to openly. Okay. I will. I, well, here's another thing that just popped into my mind is I like the lighting of the film. Like I like how in the club scene, it was, it was kind of dark, but it wasn't too dark to where you can't see anything. 
and I like how different shots, depending on the scene, you had like different, different color light. And that was one thing that I pointed out to my friend when we were reviewing this, like the different, like right there behind the demon, it's like a pink lighting. There was a, like a different kind of lighting. This scene right here was a pretty cool scene with the lighting and the way that looks with the effects. And just, I know, I'm not going to say a lot of people don't, but I know there is people who don't really pay attention to that kind of stuff, especially with, again, going back to the lighting, but it's just something since I started this show, I kind of pay attention to movies more. And small details like that, I'm just like, this This really helps this scene. It really brings out this scene because like, it's like uh, for like a dark, kind of grungy, rough scene, you don't want pretty lights. You want something that's kind of dark and kind of rough, like a dark purple or a almost a black, but like a dark purple, just like something. You don't, you don't want it to be like white, like a hospital room, I'll say, because that, that, that's not going to scare anybody. That's just like, eh. But this, I agree. You guys I agree. And thank you for that compliment. Um, I'd like to uh, give a nod to my close friend and creator's partner uh, and cinematographer, Noel Maitland, who is a longtime friend of mine. He did all the lighting and the cinematography. He essentially was a music video director for many, many years and did a ton of music videos. I'm talking big names too, you know, uh, Maroon 5, Wu-Tang. I think he worked with Britney Spears at one time, uh, Backstreet Boys. Um, just very talented, very, very very talented with the way he does lights. And um, I think that this film, there's no doubt that it's a very, very low budget movie, but we still paid a lot of attention to trying to make it look as beautiful and cinematic every chance that we had. And sometimes there were no chances to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that shot behind you, I and mean, that was just a shot on the street, but you still think about where to position people and what you can use in your environment. But um, there were there's a lot of color in the movie. The movie's very colorful. Um, a lot of two light. A lot of scenes. There's two or, only two or three lights playing. Maybe a pink, a green, and a white. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we were a very small crew, so um, there would be days when it was just him. He was shooting, pulling his focus, and running his lights. We wouldn't we wouldn't have a grip. There were a few days that we had grips, um, like my friend Max, my friend Tom, but uh, most of the time it was just him. So he would just in between things, flip the light, throw another gel on there. And I, I appreciate that compliment because I, I do think it's a very pretty movie in terms of the lighting and the cinematography. It's what separates it, I think, from we didn't just want to make something schlocky and throw it at the wall. We wanted to make something look as pretty and high value, high budget value, production value as we could for the shoestring budget that we made it on. I respect that too. I like that a lot. And I love I, I love the indie scene a whole lot. Like I go to... um. Well, I went to cons before this whole 2020 bullshit happened. And I remember sitting it being on, on a panel. And it's funny because you mentioned shoestring budget. And that's what the panel is called, like making any movie on a shoestring budget, pretty much. And I was I was the uh, moderator and I was on there with a guy. I don't know if you're familiar with his name, Ron Bonk. Yeah, I've, I think I'm Facebook friends with him. I see his post from time to time. Yeah, with him. Yeah, I was on there with him. And the cool thing about it was like. In a sense, not necessarily, obviously not making the movie part, but being the whole indie part as far as a podcast or like, like not having that backing that, well, you know, for for you guys would be the Hollywood movies. And for me, it would be like the big sponsors that all these other podcasters have or someone famous that just has the money to throw at them. And it's cool because it's like, this is all on you, basically. At the end of the day, it's all on you financially, everything. And you have to make it your own creation or whatever that is. And again, with podcasting or with movies, the similarities like that like you have to make it your career you have to make it your own and you have to make it stand out and that's one thing i really loved about this movie is you guys made it stand out on that shoot i understand it was a small budget movie that i respect that that part doesn't even some people won't watch low budget movies which to you guys you're missing out on some great great movies because with indie what i see is even if you guys have like a similar story or like a similar style, so to speak, than the Hollywood ones, you still put your own spin on it, 100% your own spin on it, or you come up with your own creative stories. And it's just like, you have to be that much more creative because you don't have that for money, which I think is a good thing because I think it, it builds you, it makes you guys better producers, directors, and all that good stuff because you have to do this. It's like, look, I don't have these, you know, I don't have these lights. I don't have these effects. I have to do this by hand. I have to, you know, I'm just going to say, for an example, I have to use, get, grab me and five of my friends and we have to do it like this, but you learn so much more by doing it like that because you have to. And then you learn everything. 
once you get up to that top level, when you do make it there, you're like, I don't have, this is easy. Like I have all this, this beautiful, expensive equipment. I have all this stuff. How, this is easy. This is, I don't know why you guys are so stressed out. <laughs> this, this is simple. What I was doing was really, you know, busting my balls to do this, but this is simple. I'm not saying that they don't work hard. Don't take that the wrong way. But I'm saying is like, I respect how you guys are building from the ground up. I love watching people grow in the indie scene. Cause it's just a beautiful thing. And it's just like, holy shit, like these people were on my podcast and now we're watching them on the big screen. This is fucking awesome. Like stuff like that. I love to see. And it's just, it makes, I think a good thing too, about being able to talk with people like yourself is how you guys pretty much tell, I mean, I'm not going to say anybody can do it to that extent of it's easy. It's obviously going to be hard work, but you could literally like, there's kids that love doing things with their phones. There's kids that want to be directors and all that. They could just start with their cell phones with all the shit you could do on your phone now. And I always tell people that, you know, as far as like podcasting goes, a lot of people come to me, Hey, I want to start a podcast. Da, 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 da. I'll give them the rundown for it. Or, Hey, I know you don't do movies, but you talked a lot. What's, what's your advice? I say, grab your phone. <laughs> I can give them the advice. This is the same thing. Grab your phone. And either if you're doing a podcast, if you want to do video, hit record and just start talking with you and your friends. If you want to do a movie, pretty much the same thing and just keep practicing at it. But I always tell them, I said, what you should do is put it out. And I say put it out there because yes, you're going to get people critiquing it. You're going to get people shitting on it, but they'll see your growth from your very first YouTube video. Let's say from day one till three years later, they're going to see that growth. If you stick with it and you really try. And I say, be passionate about it. Do not, do not get into this stuff to make money because you're not going to have that right passion for it. Do not do it for followers. Do it because you really enjoy what you're doing. And the rest will eventually come one way or another. It might not be, millions of dollars it might not be millions of followers but you will get those that cult fit i don't want to say you'll get that fan base you will get that fan base i don't care if it's one person or a hundred people or more you'll get that fan base that's just like holy shit like for you joe bizarro is dropping another movie we have to go see this or for me sir started dropping another podcast we have to go check it out like this is a must see or a must watch a must listen and i i just love it man it's it's so freaking fun and it's again it's so awesome and humbling getting to talk to people like yourself that made these type of movies. I'm just like, holy shit. You know, I can't speak to um, really too much about YouTube or like the newer technologies like TikTok or any stuff like that. But I can speak to just filmmaking in general. It is a process. It's something that really is a muscle memory kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I've been uh, in film production, TV production for 15 years now. Um, in all different capacities, as a casting director, as an assistant director, um, as a cameraman, as an editor, and I've done all those things for you know for money, reality shows, anything that you can think of. Um, living in Los Angeles, and it it really just is kind of a muscle memory thing. I do think anyone can pick it up and do it, especially with the way we we have technology nowadays. But it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you just you, your first film is probably not going to be good. Um, but maybe that's not even true, you know, uh, but you got to just, you got to, I made a ton of shorts. I had a film way back in the day that we shot on 16 and 35 called 44 robbers. I don't think we ever finished it. I mean, I've done many, 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 many things to get to this point for this feature to look the way it, it does. And this is my first movie really that I'm releasing under my brand. Um, Brides of Satan for anyone who doesn't know, and you know, maybe I shouldn't be so, candid about all of this, but I guess I, I like to be honest and open about it. This movie took five years to make. It's an 82 minute film. Um, it took five years to make. It was very low budget. It was all self-funded through one or two or three people, mostly myself. Um, <clears throat> and the way, the reason why was because we didn't have enough money to just shoot it in 10 days straight. So we would like the, the, the process of how this movie got made, the way that we would shoot a couple of days every year mm -hmm. is, is insane. It's preposterous. And this movie was shot in eight and a half days. So, which is pretty small on a scale and you know, it's pretty quick. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get too off base from what I, I want to come back to what I was saying, but I think it's a muscle memory thing. I think the more time you, sp you spend on set, the more, um, the more hats you can wear, the more things you can learn, edit, After Effects. You know, I did the sound design on this movie myself, my first time ever doing it. But all the sound design you hear 
It was something that I learned how to do because you have to. Mm-hmm. And you get stronger and stronger and stronger and wearing all these hats. And you, yeah, you become a, you become a little more confident. And I think if you're going to be a director, if you specifically want to be able to direct films, which is always everybody's answer. When you meet someone who's in the production industry, you say, hey, what, what do you do? What do you want to do? And everyone says, I want to direct. But if you want to direct films, then my advice is learn as much as you can. Learn how to sound design. Learn how to edit. Learn how to do as much as you can. Because at the end of the day, it's what you said, is it's it all comes down to you. You're the no one else is going to make your movie. No one's going to give you the money. And maybe your uncle, you have a rich family or whatever. But most of the time, you're going to be on your own. And we had some run-ins with some investors where we almost thought we were going to have money. And, you know, we thought they were going to hijack the film. And we said, fuck it. Let's keep the control. You can keep your control if it's your money. That's another very, very, very important thing is owning your own stuff, like owning your brand, owning your name, owning your creation, because there's people that throw money on something that don't really care about your creation. They don't have that passion, but they want to own it because they know they see the potential in you, but they don't care about you. It's, that may not make sense to some people, but it's like, um, yeah, you can't, you can't sell yourself short. You can't just reach out for that say just throwing a random number. You can't reach out for that million dollars because it's a million dollars. If they're, if they're willing to invest a million dollars in you, they see way, they see that you're worth way more money than a million dollars. That's the best way I can say it. Say it. If they see, if they say like, here, here's 1 million for you. We want to do this, 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 we want to own this. They probably see about 20 million. <laughs> they're just giving you like a couple pennies to them. Well, also others from experience tell the story that they're investors too, that are out there just willing to destroy you. Like they will buy your movie and then just like write it off as some kind of a tax tax expense, excuse me, and then just shelf it. You know, I mean, we almost kind of ran into a situation like that. They wanted to take enough percent to be able to own it, do whatever the fuck they want to it, throw it away, and then write it off as some kind of expense when you're dealing with certain people. So you really got to be careful about who you take your money from, why you take your money from those people. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and, and in this case, we never really had the, the good fortune to um, to get any money from any investors, but we did finish the film, and now, you know, we still we kept control, and we don't have to pay out to an executive producer. Which I think is great. And, I mean, with, with that, you guys, now people seeing your work, or when, you know, when more people get to see this work, they get to see your work, like, holy shit, you guys did this? Nice. And then people will want to... Maybe not necessarily have investors come in, but say if you guys did like an Indiegogo type of thing where it's a backing where you can have more funding with the fans helping out. And it's like, oh, shit. Yeah, this and you build your, you know, build up from that and see what happens. Which I, I will th- say, I will say, sorry to interrupt. No, you're good. I will, I will say that. Yeah, I think that's a good strategy. I think that's kind of what I did with this strategy is I waited a long time. Uh, back when we shot the first day of this, I had released about a 10, 12 minute clip on YouTube just to kind of start building a fan base for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like kind of a teaser, but it was like the first 10 minutes of the movie. And, uh, you know, I think it's good. To, that's a good strategy is to build up your fan base, build up everything that you can so that when you're ready to make the release, now you have credibility. You've put a product out there that if you believe that it looks good and is a real good film that, uh, you know, now you've got credibility. And so I think this is only the beginning for my brand and, it's, it's a lot harder to sell an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter or any of those things if you don't have credibility. You can't show a finalized product. So mm-hmm. with us, may, you know, would I have wanted to do this quicker than five years? Absolutely. I wish we could have shot this, had been done with this in a year, and I'd be on my third film by now. But sometimes you don't have that uh, luxury. And um, But I think it's very important to know when to – but also to know when to launch – and to know when to cash in and know when to like really advertise and, and do all these things. And I'm still learning. I don't have many, most of the answers, but um, you know, I think we're on a good path. And I think once you create something, your work will, you want your work to speak for you. And if you make a good film, it will. I agree with you there. I agree with you 1 million percent on that. And going back to the whole um, betting on yourself thing, I mean, 
I just think it's your, I think betting on yourself is the best investment you can make because no one's going to make you work harder than yourself. Again, you can go back to the million dollar thing I was mentioning before. At the yes, it's like cool. That's a million dollars. I've never had that much money in my life. But at the same time, you still have to work for it. And it's like I'm trying to think I had a word. This you know what you're going to put into something from day one. You know what you're going to put into something. Nobody else knows what you're going to put into it. Nobody else knows how what you can put into it. Only you know that. And those investors might be expecting. I want to say more, not necessarily more than what you can handle. But just because they, they might think they own you, like, hey, listen, we need you to do this like right now, this second. It's like, hey, listen, I'm working on this film. <laughs> I'm trying to get this piece done the way I want it at the end of the day. And I just feel like it's the I just feel like it's the best way to do things. Obviously, if you can, I'm not saying quit your job and not work and do that, but make it work for yourself. And who knows what happened? Who knows what can happen after that? And I think another cool thing, what you're saying, I know you said you wish it came out sooner than the five years, but that just shows you how dedicated you were to this craft and to this film. Cause it's, there's, pl- there's plenty of people out there all over the place that started a film, whatever, ha- whether it be financial, whatever the case may be, they didn't get it done and it may not always be their fault, but they gave up on it. Like, you know what? Screw it. I'm done. Or this, may- this career path might not be for me because this didn't work out. And that's not how life works. Like nothing works perfect. My very first episode funny story i love telling this is i had this little recorder about this big and it was me my brother and one of my friends we were going to a con it was my friend's first time going to a con it was called scaracon this was a few years ago and i brought the recorder with me i saw it i was like oh no drive up let's just why don't we just record only about a two-hour drive stop to go pee and all that stuff and i turned the recorder on right hit record and we went to a rest stop because like i said we had to pee and whatever so i shut it off get back in the car turn it back on record you know, get to the con, shut it off. Did the same thing on the way home. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going to go upload this to the computer, set in the third, plug it in the computer, nothing. I'm like, what the fuck? So I finally decided to actually read, like look on the recorder and read. So it's on off was the one switch. And then the other switch was record, save. And I just turned it on and hit record and then just turned it off. Never hit save. Well, but by fire, man. It's you live it's in learn. I'm, yeah. I'm, hap- I'm happy that that happened. I mean, I wish I had the conversation. I know the conversation was hilarious, but I'm happy that it happened. I'm happy it happened with the people that I was with because those people that I knew. So it wasn't like versus like if me say this right here, if I fucked up with this, this would look bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I uh, forgive you. But like, you know what I mean. And I've had like I've had that happen. Didn't deter me. I was just like, fuck it, it happened. It, it's a funny story. I've had two computers crash on me. I've had a hard drive crash on me once or twice. And I'm just like, fuck, man. I'm like, should I really be doing it? And I'm like, you know what? I love this too. I have way too much fun not to do this. I just have to keep right on. Just keep fighting with it. And that's what I did. Like, keep going. And I eventually got myself a good computer. I just ordered another, like this computer is fine, but I ordered another external hard drive, 10 terabyte hard drive, which is going to be here tomorrow. Cause as you know, I mean, for me with podcasting, this shit takes up a lot of room. And I know film takes up 10 times more. more. (laughs) So it's just like, you know, just to have that extra space to save stuff and take care of stuff. And it's just, I love it, man. I love it. I wouldn't trade anything for it because it's, it's one of those things when you have that passion that you really, really care about, people can tell you're really passionate about something. People can tell you really enjoy something just by the way you go at it. Like I was saying, those bumps in the road, a lot of people, if you don't have that, like if I didn't have the passion for podcasting, after my first episode, I would have probably quit after the first episode. Maybe after, or maybe after my first computer crash. But you know what? Fuck it. I tried. Computer doesn't work. Screw it. But I was like, no, I got, I got to find a way to keep doing this. I got to find a way to keep doing this. I had my moments for sure with the film, um, where I felt like there was going to be no light at the end of the tunnel. And I, I definitely want to give a thanks to this gentleman named the Jimmy C. Jamie Cogill, the Jimmy C. I found this. Um, this musical artist who lives in uh, Melbourne, Australia. I found him online and Mm -hmm. he started putting out songs for me, sending me songs. And this guy is just so talented, man. Like plays guitar, bass, drums, sings, writes all the songs, mixes, masters, just like the conversation we've been having can do it all. And it did, he did so because he was sick of playing drums for other bands. And he was like, I want to learn to do it all. And the guy is just a fucking genius. Um, I, that's the only way I can describe him. He's so talented. Anyone who's out there, check out the Jimmy C. 
um, on Facebook or Bandcamp. Nice. Anyhow, he, he would send me these songs and there were times when I felt like I was never going to finish the movie and I'd get a song from him all of a sudden and put it on and it would just inspire me so much. And I would just be like, it would just skyrocket me out of my seat. And I'd be like, holy shit, I got to do the next day, you know? And sometimes you just got to find those little moments, those little inspirations in life that keep you going on your project, keep you passionate. Cause it's, you can get burned out on stuff that you do. You can really start to hate it, you know? And as I was um, sending off the deliberal, the, the, the deliverables for um, distribution just this week, I was, I had to watch the movie. I was doing the sound automation and I watched the movie I don't know, twice a day for like eight days. Mm -hmm. You have to watch your own project that many times. You d it makes you sick. It literally makes you feel ill and it gives you anxiety. And so, I, you know, I, it's kind of like a beautiful thing and a horrible thing at the same time. Because like, it's done. It's almost done. It's almost done. I don't want to miss anything. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I guess I got a little sidetracked, but... um. Filmmaking is hard, especially when you are doing it with your own money. But I'm sure it's rewarding at the same time. Once you get that, once once it's finished and you watch the film, well, maybe not for you because you said it's making you sick because you watched it so much. But when others get to watch the film and you get the feedback on it, good or bad, because I feel like negative feedback is, ju is just as important, if not more important than positive. As long as it's the real actual feedback, not just I hate this. It sucks. Blah blah. Which I do that for some movies because some movies I just hate. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know how there's trolls. Like they, they just do it just to troll. I've heard that that that's a, like a whole new thing where people just go to your IMDb and try to destroy your movie without even seeing it. And I, I can't understand why our society is so idiotic. But I guess the internet is the answer. You know, I'll give you a few reasons. I'll give you a couple of reasons. One, you know, I'd actually rather not even have that conversation. I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. Um, oh, no, I was just going to pretty much say people are scared to get put. People know behind the keyboard, they're not going to get punched in the face for saying just anything. When okay. we grow up as kids, you say certain things to somebody, you have to either say it over the phone or face to face. It wasn't, I'm talking shit to you from Albany, New York, and you're talking shit to me from Texas on the computer. Check. Check. Yes. Punch okay. Num what's number two? Number two is... A lot of times, not everybody, but a lot of times we react more towards negative negativity than positivity. So people that, and some people know that they might not necessarily, like they might, not, they might say they say your movie sucks. They might just want your attention because they know you may respond to that versus this movie's awesome. So when you respond to that, it's, oh, hey, I really like this movie. I'm just trying to get your attention. And people will say, well, you know, why don't you just say something nice? Because a lot of people, times you scroll over the nice comments. You might like them. This is cool. This is cool. You might wow. like them. Yeah. <laughs> but the negative, you're like. Okay, That's first is fucking pissing me off talking shit. I got to I got to defend myself versus ignoring the negativity and you know bringing in the positivity like hey, thanks thank you for your feedback on my movie. Thank you for you know just just saying that, or something like that to the positivity and ignoring the negative the trolls. Okay. Yeah. All right, what's number 3? Uh number 3 Some people are just assholes. <laughs> <laughs> like, like they have nothing better to do but just I'll drink to that. And they don't even, it's not that they want the reaction. They're just literally bored. And they. So um, do you, are there anything, is there anything specific that you'd like to talk about the film? Did you have any questions about the film itself or the process? I like your show already so far. This is very freestyle. And I like that we're talking almost about like, um, so, you know, sociopolitical things mm -hmm. as well. But, um, you know, do you want to talk about the movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. So as far as this, how did you come up? Oh, actually, because the demon showing up. What yeah. was the effect with like, how did you guys, how did you guys do that? <laughs> the demon? Yeah. So uh, I have a friend named Draco Rex, and I met him at a Monster Palooza horror convention. He was a, he was a friend of my other friend named Natasha Talons. And she was a, uh, she used to do adult movies. And then she started doing a bunch of crazy, she did a movie called Black Devil Doll. One called like the G-string horror, and one called I think vaginal holocaust. Wow. All right, some pretty pretty hardcore, nasty, crazy shit. So, anyways, I knew Natasha because I worked with her on a movie called The Horror Convention Massacre, 
way back in the day in Cleveland, Ohio with my friend Joe Estrica and his company OSS. Mm-hmm. So I run into her at a convention and I meet her and her friend, uh, this guy Draco Rex, and he worked with this guy Thomas Surprenant. And he's been all about out and about, and they're out in Sacramento, I believe. Um, anyways, I told him about my script. I bought him some whiskeys. We had some drinks at the bar. I was just kind of being friendly, and I was just kind of being like naturally just being myself. I just was in a generous mood. I wasn't trying to get anything out of it. Mm-hmm. And like years later, I get a, a, a message from them, or I was looking for an effects artist, and I, it's the guy that I just bought a, a drink for. And he's like, hey, I remember meeting you at Monster Palooza. You were hilarious. You bought me some whiskeys. What, what, what is it that you needed that you posted for? And I was like, no shit. So basically, um, you know, Thomas and Draco, this guy, Draco Rex, he, him and Thomas work together and they do all these kind of costumes. And he'll, he'll do like werewolves and ogres and demons and everything and these two guys work together in tandem and they're always making these really great great creations so luckily they were just kind of down to work on the project totally helped us out pretty much did everything for free which was i mean you can't i don't even know what that monster would have cost a lot of money probably our whole budget for that fucking demon on a real hollywood movie let's face it so just giant thanks to them and they would come from down from Sacramento and Draco Rex. He played, he plays basically the, uh, one of the evil thugs at the bar. When you go in, he plays the demon in the nightmare with the horns behind you right now. He plays the shotgun killer. Who's got a shotgun in the, in the um, junkyard. And mm-hmm. then he plays Charoon, the demon at the end. So one guy played all four of those characters. Oh, wow. Which is just fantastic two of those in one day. Um, and then, so, you know, I didn't get to see a whole lot of the process. I wish we would have had behind the scenes that day, but it was Thomas and Lisa. And I believe they put him in a full on, they completely covered him in latex, 100%. Some kind of latex bodysuit. They started makeup when we started the day. And that was our last day of shooting. That was day like eight. And they started makeup in the morning and we shot that scene at the end of the day at almost probably 11 or 12 hours, you know, probably 10 or 11, 12 hours. So he was in that all fucking day long. I believe that his eyes were patched over. So he couldn't see anything. Wow. Imagine just being walking around with your eyes, just completely blind for eight hours on set. And, uh, and they just glossed him off. And, and that was it. And that was pretty much, that's all I really know about it. But man, that character just looks fantastic. And, but now that you know, he's blind, he has a lot of limited mobility, which restricted us with the amount of action that he could do. Um, And then also uh, we actually had an exploding head gag where they actually made a silicone mold of his head. And we tried to explode it with pressure with, I believe like a, almost like a fire extinguisher type deal, Mm -hmm. but it went pretty horribly wrong. It did not work out. So on the special editions DVD, you can see like the failed head made a latex, but um, we ended up going digital on that shot. Not something that I wanted to do, but sometimes you just have to get the movie done. And you're forced to just kind of like make it work. That was that was no that was cool though, and that explains a lot because when my friend were watching after we, when we were reviewing it and stuff, he was saying how um he wishes the demon could have been in the in the movie more and in the story more. But what you just said makes plenty of sense of why that couldn't be limited visibility, limited mobility, and that shit takes all day to. <laughs> he was in that all day. Yeah, and, special effects are. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing. And if you try to make a special effects movie, you're going to really fuck yourself because it takes a lot of time and gags don't work the way you think. If you're doing a slasher movie and you're, movie and you're like, oh, we'll just you know slash the throat and we'll just stab here and stab there, it doesn't always work out. I mean, we had a lot of gags on this that did not work out and became just like shorter cuts or had to get played up with um, a sound effect or some a little bit of digital VFX. Like we use digital VFX, but very kind of carefully. Mm-hmm. 
like we didn't overdo it and we tried to keep them very subtle to where you kind of maybe wouldn't know the difference. Um, but yeah, they're hard, man. I, I loved it though. Like that was, that was definitely one of my favorite visuals of the movie was the way the demon looked. I was like, this, this looks so fucking badass. Like it's just so cool. And it looks like the skin is kind of like melting. Yeah. He was, and, it was dripping wet. I don't, I don't know how they made it look like that. I guess Vaseline or KY jelly or something. <laughs> well, it fits for the movie. If it's that. <laughs> well, you know, when we tried to explode the head and it didn't work. We were all covered in goo. It was everywhere. I was throwing it on the walls, and we were in overtime. We had to get out, so we're like we were like like people were cleaning up while we were. There was like seven or eight of us there by the time you know by by that time people were going home, and uh, we're like I, I'm going home. I helped for the day. I'm out of here. But uh, man, this shit was everywhere, and uh, to me, it still isn't as like juicy and like disgusting enough. Like I wish it could be like. 10 times more, but uh, you kind of get what you pay for. You could just do that. Just do that next time. That's all. Do it. Yeah, exactly. But um, I was going to, Oh, how'd you come up with the story for this? Like this is a two part and I do for this. Sure. Do you have to be like in a certain mindset to write stories? Or are you just like one of those people that just like, Oh shit, I got to put this down on paper right now. I feel like I should answer that first question first. And if I don't answer the second one, let's come, let's come back. Cause that's, okay. I'll get to, I'll go to out there. Um, the way I came up with this really was actually, it's kind of a long story. I'll try to summarize as much as possible. Um, my writing partner and cinematographer, Noel Maitland, and I, it was actually his, his title in the first place. It all started with the title, Brides of Satan. We just thought it was a very fantastic, provocative title. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we had learned at the time, and we thought was just really kind of blew our minds, was that distribution companies love to buy movies that start with the letter A, B, or C because it's the first on the shelf. Ah. And so it's the first thing that you see on the shelf back in the days of Blockbuster. And even today, it's probably the first thing that you see on the shelf, you know. Makes sense. For streaming. In fact, I recently saw uh, Lloyd Kaufman's uh, Trauma uh, Company just put a movie out called like Shakespeare shitstorm or some really weird thing like that. And they put a hashtag at the top of it because it played at AFM. So the hashtag put it even before the A's which oh. I thought was a smart move. Um, Lloyd Kaufman, of course. So anyways, um, the title came first and my friend had this idea that it was, gonna, this movie was going to be about this, uh, this guy and his girlfriend in love who the girlfriend gets kidnapped by these like satanic bikers, these like kind of demons. Mm -hmm. And he kind of has to go through the desert and go through hell and battle these like demonic bikers and this like satanic cult to get his girlfriend back. And we like just, we were in love with this idea. Kind of uncoincidental, like it doesn't really make a difference, but fast forward like a couple of years later and the movie Mandy came out uh, with Nicolas Cage which I was a huge fan of. Um, but it was a sense, essentially almost the same like plot. Like it was very, very similar to what we were writing. We were just like, wow, that's kind of wild that someone made the movie that we kind of dreamed to make. But anyhow, we had come up with this plot and I had written the entire script. I wrote a 90 page script, spent months on it, really fine tuned it. And was like, this thing is ready to present. And then it was time to do some casting. And I knew that I wanted to include, um, I knew that I wanted to like do a mix of like people in LA who were like kind of LA underground icons. And I wanted to use adult performers. And I wanted to try to use like horror performers if I could. And I wanted to mix these kind of like cultures into a film mm -hmm. to give it as much like social uh, media outreach kind of as possible to kind of like really dip into all the different markets. It was kind of my plan. Um, so then as I started casting, I, I got like Joanna Angel, which I was very happy to, to get her in the mix. There she is right behind you. And uh, originally it was supposed to be Bonnie Rotten was supposed to play Malice McMahon. And I had all these like top level award winning adult stars. And I felt like this was going to be a rest recipe for success. Mm -hmm. um, but as, I, as we started getting those people, we realized 
I realized more and more how difficult it would be to, you know, take, you can't just put everybody on a bus and like ship them out to, to Joshua tree and put them in a hotel room because schedules conflict and all of these things, you know? Yeah. And so I didn't have the money or the resources to kind of do what I thought I could do. So what happens back to the drawing board, <laughs> I pretty much rewrote the entire script. And I was like, you know what? Let's not do it in the desert. Let's do it in LA because we have to, we have these people now, they live in LA, blah, blah, blah. Let's just stick around here. So wrote for LA, rewrote the script, sent it out, shot that first day with everybody. And I, you know, I really wanted to make a good relationship with all of my actors and crew on that first day. And I felt like I did. I made them believe that the project was something that they wanted to be a part of. So that was a success in itself. Um, so here's what ended up actually happening. <laughs> Well, here's just one more quick anecdote that I think is a really good story that I love to tell or would love to tell you is uh, we shot that first scene. I don't even know what year it was now, but um, we shot this whole first scene where they introduced the, all the characters and the couple and the setup and the kidnapping and this and that and the other. And we had a girl named Susie Q or we had a girl named Rachel Rampage. She was an adult star from Canada. And she's like been on a bunch of TV shows now, the magicians and some other things. And she was playing one of the parts, the main girls. And we shot that, we cut that, we put it out. We were getting our brand going. And when we had enough money to shoot the next day, we contacted her and she's like, you know, I'm still in Canada. I'm back in Canada. It's going to be hard for me to get there. I don't know when I'm going to be available. My schedule's busy, this and that. So we were like, what are we going to do? We can't wait forever to on this one person. So what I did was went on Facebook and I was like, posted pictures of the stills of the girl. And I was like, does anyone know anyone who looks like this person? And luckily we met a girl named Susie Q Williams, Amalea Dark. And uh, she basically like put some extensions in, dyed a piece of her hair, already had some of the clothes, we put some fake tattoos on her and, you know, um, she stepped in and, and played the part. But originally this character was supposed to live all the way to the end. So we were like, we don't want to get caught in the act doing this. So we killed her in the next scene. Oh, wow. So after that happened and guess what? You didn't even notice, did you? No, but now I got to go back and watch. <laughs> and you will notice instantly. But it, it's just a beautiful thing that you can really do with film is you can really trick your viewer if you, you know, you, you play the right angles. So I just love the fact that we pulled that off. And, you know, I remember Joanna Angel telling me they did it on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. They totally replaced Hillary and like no one, you know, no one talked about it. Oh, and Viv. Right. Well, or, yeah. Or Aunt Viv. I just remember one of the characters got replaced and our actor, Joanna yeah, yeah, that one was way more noticeable though, just because the oh, super noticeable, <laughs> but they don't mention it. You know, so you know what's funny? Just because you're on that real quick, there was an episode where um because when she left, she was pregnant in real life, but she was pregnant in the show. And when they had the baby, it was the new Aunt Viv, and you remember Jazz the character, he was like, There's something different about you. <laughs> yeah, was, like, exactly. I think we had a line like that in there actually at one point and just cut it out. Cause we were like, fuck it. Let's just play it. Let's just go for it. Yeah. But, but that brings me to my next kind of like rift in the story of the writing mm -hmm. is that once that happened, we realized a big, we, a big light bulb kind of went off for us where we were like, you know, we don't have the money and the luxury to just plan things out as we want. If we're lucky, all the actors will stick with us. If we're lucky, Mindy will stick with us to the very end. But we don't know if that's going to happen. And when you spread a movie out over five years, so many things change. Hair, weight, deaths in the family. Who knows? You know? And mm -hmm. so people, people move. People move away. People quit the business. So we were like, at, at some point, and I forget where it was, but it's not really that important. At some point, we decided that we would just shoot the film, get all of our dailies in, do our cuts, put it together, Get a, see how it was coming together, look at it, 
analyze it, talk about it, and then we would write for the next day. Just me and my one partner. And so basically we made this film. We originally had a full script that got thrown out the window. Then I wrote another script. It got thrown out the window. And then we were like, okay, we're about 20 minutes in, 25 minutes in. How do we want to go from here? And from that point on, we addressed the movie. I think the next day we shot, we shot for two days straight, but we only did a two day thing once. We addressed the movie as we went and we would look at what we have and we would reconstruct things and we would move things around. And it was a really difficult process, but I think that it made the movie exciting and interesting and dynamic. And um, yeah, so like it, it, there's, there's no traditional path with this film. In fact, it's like completely the opposite of how movies are typically made out of necessity. I think that's pretty awesome though. Like, I mean, it's, it's very non-traditional as you say, but I think that's really freaking cool that you guys did it like that. And especially the way the movie turned out. Now, is that something you would do again? I mean, minus the whole issues. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. I would not ever pray that on my worst enemies. Um, before I did this film, I had, a, I did another feature film, which I still also has not been released called the problem. Why? It starred three characters, Damian D. Smith, Dave Casella, and Matthew Teardrop. And it was about these three uh, high school kind of misfits who were like strange friends who um, they basically reunite and they go to uh, go back to their high school reunion because of a love interest and they get lost and they kind of find each other. And it's this drama and it's all of this crazy kind of stuff about life. Um, I did that movie in five days for $5,000 consecutive bang 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 chop 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 long scenes very jim jarmusch kind of this intentional static camera because that's the only way you can shoot a movie i think in five days like for five thousand dollars um but you know that was a great experience uh and i loved the way that that went down um i would rather do a movie for less amount or well, less money but be able to do it consecutively with the help that i need then more money spread out across time or having to constantly fix problems. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes plenty of sense. What was the second thing that you wanted to ask me? Uh, about this, hang on, let me see if I remember now. It was a two part oh, question. It was a mindset. Like, you have to be in a certain mindset to write, to do a movie. To or, write or direct? I'll say both. Um, you know, I definitely have like some habits that I take on when I, when I try to write, um, mm -hmm. I'm a very, like, I'm a kind of an obsessive person. I, I, I'm very clean and a little bit OCD. I like to have things kind of neat and organized. Um, I like to read literature, like read about other films while I'm getting inspired. I like to make sure that I'm watching a lot of films while I'm trying to get inspired. And I kind of take all that in, um, and then I think for me, like, I think music's a, a good thing too. Um, I like to sometimes with brides, I actually had a, like a brides of Satan playlist that I made on Spotify and it had certain groups and certain bands. And I would listen to that while I would write just to kind of keep me in the, in the spirit of it. But that was like brides year one, you know? So by year like five, it's a whole different soundtrack. But uh, I think those are kind of good things to do, um, at least for me, to kind of keep myself inspired, keep myself motivated, keep myself, you know, kind of looking at films that I think are cool, music that I think is interesting. I don't know. It helps for me. I think that's awesome. I think that's really cool because I ask that question to people and they have everybody has different. Some people just as far as writing or direct, they're just like, look, I just go in there and I just my brain, the way my brain works is go in there and direct or, you know, I just. I have to write something down. I'll think of something in the middle of the day or I don't know, or wake up in my sleep and just write it down and then go lay back down wherever the case may be. So everybody has their own style. I think, I think it's different for directing. I, I say, I would say like my approach and my approach is actually very, I don't know. I'm still learning. I'm still a baby in the game really, you know? And, um, but like I, I work with a lot of non-actors mm -hmm. and so I love working with real actors because they show up and they know the scene that you sent them a week or two or whatever it is before, even the night before they know 
their script, but um, I've worked with a lot of non-actors. And so I've gotten used to like kind of feeding them lines on set is like a thing that I do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, or like I'll make things up or I'll see if something's working or not. But I think you kind of have to in have it in your head what it's supposed to sound like or what the characters should sound like. Like, I don't know. A lot, tone for me is like really important. And I remember we had one scene where uh, Damien D. Smith comes into a, a room and he breaks up the sacrifice and he goes, he's like, I, I hate to curse so much on your show, but he's like, what kind of bullshit is this? <laughs> and I, I must've had him read the line like 20 times. And I don't, I don't typically do that because I don't, you don't have time, but uh I just wanted to hear every single bit of the phonetic in a certain way. Mm -hmm. and I think that's important as a director to make sure like the voice and the tone and the delivery of the, of the character comes out the way that you want it to. It didn't always happen like that with brides. There's some scenes where I'm like, ah, I wish I would have had another take, you know, but the sun's going down. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand that. I respect that. Cause I mean, it's, and my, by the way, swear as much as you want in this show. But um, what I was going to say is it's it has to be similar with music. Like when you're hearing a certain song, I'm sure that artist is like, all right, I got to retake. I got to redo this. I have. It just didn't sound right to me. And I like how you're saying if it doesn't sound right to you as the director, I got it. You know, this needs to be fixed. Can you just can you just try that again, please? Just say it like this or, you know, just read that again. There's just like a tonality that I like to hear sometimes when I'm trying to get a certain line, like. It's hard to explain. It's like really hard to explain, but you just know it when you hear it. Mm -hmm. and, and I've heard one of the worst things that you can do as a director, you know, is to, you know, is to say like, say it like this and like, you know, play it back for them. Like the best thing to do is to use, you know, words to kind of indicate how you want that to sound. Yeah. Like, you know, so I try to do that as often as possible, but sometimes you're like, it's the 12th, 13th, 14th hour. And, um, you start losing your patience and you're like, just fucking say the line. <laughs> but I think in your case, too, how you were just saying, you're still like a student to the game, which I think keeping that mindset, no matter how far you get in the game, you should always be a student, not afraid to learn. Cause we all know those asshole know-it-alls that just feel they know everything. Oh, it has to be done like this. I know how to do this, 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 it's like, but you really don't. You think you do because people are, you know, yeah. So I, I like that. I like that. I think that's going to take you. That's definitely going to take you place. It's going to take you far and it's going to get your fan fanfare up more because people love that. type. They love hearing that type of shit behind the scenes stuff and all that. I think we're all students until we're dead, man. I do too. It's just not all of us will admit that we're students. <laughs> Some people think that they're teachers and only teachers. You can be a student and a teacher at the same time. Which yeah, I learn that every damn day of my life. True that. But yeah, this oh man, I gotta now I gotta go back and watch that film <laughs> to see if I noticed a change with the two. There's so many, there's so many crazy things. So in that picture that we just scrolled back, she had a black mohawk. Mm -hmm. So in the first so like, but we put her in the first scene with the she's in the stripper pole with the yellow mohawk. And then we shoot the day first day one, she's got the black mohawk where we introduce the character. And then when they come out of the club, right after they kidnap the couple, they break out the club. If you look real close. She's pulling her hood down over her hair right at the end of the shot, right in the background because she's got different color hair. Her hair is yellow now. Yeah. And she was like, I don't want to dye my hair, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, Malice, it's fine. We'll figure it out. You know, I mean, you have so many issues when you stretch a film out like that. So, you know, we pulled her hair down her hood down and, uh, and we go on with the scene. But the funny thing is, like that's like one little thing that we're hiding. There's a completely different person playing the character that you've already seen, but it's a mind, it's a mind trick because we show her, we show the uh, girl B at the beginning and then we sh show girl B again. Then we show girl A, then we show girl B. And there's just something about the way your brain, I think processes things. I, I bet 99% of people who don't listen to this podcast will never catch that. And you know what's cool about that though is when you say it and we go back and watch it, and that's what I again I have no examples, but with a lot of movies, they're like, yo, this scene, this is what you know, if you pay attention to the background, <laughs> there's this going on. You're just like, oh shit. And I like I like that you guys kept that in there. Even if it was for budgetary reasons, I still love that you guys kept that in there because again, it's something you really have to go like once 
you go back and watch it again. You're like, holy shit. You're like, how the fuck did I miss this? Damn look, it. I, I love continuity. I love being able to have shots match and make things look continuous and like have a nice flow. But, you know, as a director with, when you don't have a lot of money, I think you got to not worry about continuity so much. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, this is another quick story. I remember that first day we were in the club and, um, you know, they hijack like some money out of the register and uh, Rachel throws the money to Malice and she's holding it and she's got the thing. And there was this whole thing where we were like trying to plot this thing out. We shot that day on a steady cam. And Joanna was like, but you didn't hand it to her this way or you didn't hand it to her that way. And she and she was interested in the continuity. And Malice is like, it's under my she goes, he doesn't care. And I go, I took the fucking uh the envelope. And I like chucked it across the room <laughs> like some Sam Peckinpah moment because I was like, no one's looking at this envelope underneath your arm right now. Like we're getting caught in the details of the, of the, of the way all of this is operating. And there's it's this blue bank envelope under your arm. I don't give a shit. And I just <laughs> chucked it across the room and we continued the scene. And when she walks out of the club, we don't see it. You don't see the blue envelope because your mind's not looking at that. Yeah. And if it is, talk about it at IMDb all you want, kids. <laughs> That's <laughs> important. Uh, you got big battles, man, when you're like kind of fighting the clock, right? Yes, you damn sure you do. You damn sure do. But yeah, man, I, I like, again, I like what you guys did with that. And just those little things. Now I'm going to go back and look for the, <laughs> look for those things. But I do have a question. You said that you're going through distribution and all that. Do you have a timetable when the movie will be out for the public? Absolutely. I'm glad that you asked that. Um, we just signed a deal with a company called Dark Side Releasing. And I'm really kind of happy that we did. Met this guy named Vince. They're out of Canada. We, we entered our film into American film market very late in the game too. And, um, got a lot of offers. I, I, you know, I ain't too proud to, to admit that, but, um, he just seemed right. He just kind of seemed to know our stuff and I think he's going to push it pretty hard. And I think we already have a built in audience cause we worked for many years to kind of build the brand and to get people knowing about the film. So it's going to come out from, um, dark side releasing. It's going to be on DVD, um, pretty much, beginning mid beginning of january i would say oh, first awesome. second week of january so about you know four or five weeks from now um we just shipped the drive so uh, about a month it's going to be on uh, darksidereleasing.com you can order the dvd directly and then we're going to be on like uh, amazon and itunes uh, 2b roku all those vod uh pluto platforms mm -hmm. i can't say all but you know whatever we can yeah We'll be on that by like uh, March, 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 April, you know, th okay. third, three, four months into the year. And then by uh, we're looking by mid-year, by June, July to be on DVD internationally, um, you know, internationally on DVD and VOD. And then we'll be in retail like Walmart, Barnes and Noble, hopefully Target, things of that nature. So he got us a great uh, situation. We're going to be awesome. on all of the platforms. It's going to start like if you're really a fan, you kind of kind of if you want to get the movie now, you kind of got to buy it off the website um, and then it'll be available for VOD to stream and VOD to um, own. And then you'll see it in retail for like in, in the bargain bin eventually at Walmart. Oh, hey, nothing wrong with that, man. Bar I can't wait to buy my own movie for three ninety nine. Listen, them bargain bins, you know, like I mean, my wife and I would go to Walmart sometimes to just grab something out the bin. Hey, we're watching this tonight. And well, hopefully we get paired up with like ninja assassins from Mars or something. You know, they put them the splits together. Uh, yeah, that'd be cool. I'm gonna have to get that. What once once we're done recording, well, in general, I want to get all your links and stuff because I'm definitely gonna want to purchase that from the website next month. To yeah, I appreciate that so much. Because, like I said, I I love India. I'm a huge support. Anytime I can afford to back something or grab, something, I always try to. Because again, I cool. know how it is. Just. Well, I will also say he, Vince was the one thing that he really was into is he was very into physical media, mm -hmm. which is like a lost art. You know, a lot of people don't really do physical media anymore, but horror fans, especially in sci-fi and genre film fans really do. And so Vince was very adamant about making, um, well, it was my idea to make a budget, budget friendly DVD 
that you can buy as cheap as possible. I was like, I want this thing to be as cheap as they can get it for. And then he was like, but I want to make a Blu-ray double disc fold out brochures, all the pictures, all the posters. And we have like seven or eight movie posters. Um, you know, he's like, I want to, we have a commentary on there. We have a three hour featurette. We have an original soundtrack from Jimmy C. So he's got this whole, um, this whole uh, Blu-ray thing that he's planning out. So I think that's really cool too, to have physical media that people can get the extra shit if they want. Now the blue, see now you, now you got me. I'm like the Blu-ray because I'm, I'm. That's what I usually get when I can. It's the Blu-rays with all the extras. I love getting that. All the extras. I'll see if oh. we can just send you one, man. Well, I'll see what the deal is. I don't know yet. It's still a new relationship. We're still just kind of yeah. in our courting but, courting phase. Hey, there's nothing. Wrong. Hey, I have no problem going and grabbing a DVD and a Blu-ray. I do giveaways on my show, so maybe I'll buy the Blu-ray for myself and do a giveaway and give somebody the DVD. That's cool. And, you know, because this this is one of those films that I feel like for as I won't say you're not a horror fan if you don't see it. I hate when people use that term if you've never seen it because it's I look at that like if you weren't introduced into it, there's no way you're going to be able to see it. So I will say this when this is out on for you guys to buy and stream and all that stuff. Definitely check it out. Definitely give it at least two one or two watches. It's worth it. It's a fun film. There's titties. Who doesn't love titties? (laughs) And listening to this episode. Once you hear what he put into this film and the passion that he has for directing and writing and everything and just being a creator, that alone should sell you on it. If you love it or hate it, that alone should sell you on it. And any other independent creator out there should sell you on their work because they bust their ass doing what they do and they do an amazing job at what they do. It might not be for you. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't support it. That's just how I look at it. I mean, check it out. At the very least, check it out. You're never going to know how you feel about it until you watch it. That's I love it, <laughs> man. I love it. But I appreciate I appreciate the plug. Oh hell yeah. I I have to, man. It's it's like my thank you for you coming on my show for one and and help us all grow. What you come on here, you have fans that'll come check out this episode. I have fans that'll come check out your work. It, it helps you. we gotta work together with this. That's what people need to start learning. It's not Sit about around. Yeah. Oh man, this was fun, man. We gotta yeah. do this again. We got to do this. No, again. I know. It's like, I don't want, I, now I'm like, now I'm just getting warmed up. All right. Just ask me any, any other last question. Just throw it at me. Whatever you got. Any other last questions? Let me think. What's your next project idea? That's a fantastic question. Um, we're looking to do a, a new film um, for about a very small budget range. Again, once probably like a, uh, between the 30 and $60,000 range. Mm-hmm. Really small, um, probably 10-day movie. And right now, I'm kind of working on this movie called uh, Ceremony of the Witch. Believe it or not, it's, uh, it's, it's something different. It's um, somewhat like deals with some LGBTQ issues. Also is a love story. Uh, also is a drama. And also deals with you know, like witchcraft and, and what, what we kind of understand of witchcraft mm-hmm. um, and a lot of other horror shit. Like I, it's, it's like um, those witchcraft, witchboard, weird witch movies meets Hellraiser with lesbian witches. Interesting. Yeah. It's something else. But after doing this movie brides where we had like so many characters, I think there's like 75 people in the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you probably noticed there's just a lot of movement. Uh, I wanted, I want to do something a little more stripped down where I can like not be so go, go, go rush, rush, rush all the time and be able to kind of focus a little more on the acting and the dialogue and being able to get, not that anyone did a bad job, but getting, getting stronger, more focused performances that can really draw you in. Um, So I want to do something a little different, but it's still going to be sexy it's still probably going to have a lot of nudity and you know, provocativeness and all these things that, that, you know, fans and distributors like and international markets like, um, but yeah, we're, I think we're going to make a witch a lesbian, witch movie about love. I like it. <laughs> I'm sold. I'm hoping you guys do an Indiegogo so I can help back that and get an awesome Blu-ray yeah. or something. You're fantastic, man. I, I really appreciate your support. We did an Indi- Indiegogo and you know, those are hard to do. You really got to, you really got to work on those. 
I do agree. Like, I don't know much about him, but I do, I do agree with that. And I feel with a lot of the more successful ones I see, they already have some sort of workout. So you can at least see what they do and see what they're about. Exactly. It's either that or they have a name that everybody knows. They have a name that everyone knows, which I don't, again, I don't know how any of that stuff works, but all that does help. And I wish you guys the best of luck with that. I hope I know it's going to happen. I'm not going to say I hope it happens. I know it's going to happen. And you had me at nudity. <laughs> So, no, seriously, like, I, I really do love what you guys did with this. I really did enjoy it. And, again, like I said, I got to go back, rewatch it, see what I missed, see those little scenes that I missed. And I just can't wait to see what you guys have. I, I just can't wait to see what you have in store next, not just with this movie, but following movies. And just I know it's going to be a great, great, great fun thing. And anytime you want to come in here to promote, let me know if it's horror you got the horror research starting show. If it's non horror, you have the popcorn and pints. So either way, I got indie covered now, guys. <laughs> Thanks way. so much, man. This was great. I really enjoyed talking to you. Like, yeah, the conversation just got more and more fun as we went on. I, I agree with you 1 billion percent on that, man. And again, I greatly, greatly appreciate you taking the time to come on here. Can't wait to do it. Like I said, I can't wait to do this again. I always have fun with this stuff. Cool. And, Again, best of luck with everything. Best of luck with Brides of Satan. I hope every freaking copy sells. And I got to figure out, I'll, I'll discuss this off everything, but I got to find a way to order the Blu ray, get it sent to you, get it signed, get it. Matter of fact, the Blu ray, oh, really? the Blu ray, because the DVD giveaway will be signed. I want the Blu ray signed for myself, or maybe I'll grab two Blu rays, give one away, and keep one. Who knows? We'll see. Awesome. It's Sounds just. Awesome. Something I, I feel like I want to, I know I want to do. It's just something that I feel, again, we should all do to help each other out. Even if you don't like the movies, people, you can buy the movie, get it signed, and give it away to somebody. There you go. There's an ask for every seat is how I always look at it. Exactly. If you guys want to find me on social, you can find me on Instagram at Joe Bizarro Studios. You can find the movie uh, on Instagram at uh, Brides of Satan Movie. And I'm also on Facebook. As, at Joe Bizarro Studios and Facebook at Brides of Satan Movie as well. And uh, I think we have a YouTube channel. There's some other weird shit on there too. So, <laughs> Yeah, man. Like I said, after this is wrapped up, just send me your links. I'm actually going to do this probably tomorrow and try to get it out. What's tomorrow? What is today? Today's Tuesday. I try to get it out Thursday because I have two episodes. What are we on? I don't know. Weird. Yeah. I get mixed up, but I'm going to try to have this out within the next two days. I'm going to edit it tomorrow, have it out within the next two days. I'll, I'll push it out there too. I can't wait. And I will send it to you, of course, audio and video. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your time. Again, everybody, go check out Joe Bizarro's work, his creations. There's a lot more in store. Love the energy and the lighting in the movie. The lighting in the movie, people. You have to see the fucking lighting in the movie. Lighting and titties and demons. Lighting. There you go. <laughs> and as always, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you all for the support. I'll see you in